Welcome, I'm Sébastien Lacoste. Uh, this is Nicolas Fischbar. We are working for Cold Telecom, a large ISP in uh, in, uh, in Europe. So we are working in Switzerland. So the topic today will be uh, layer two routing protocols and uh, a few hints and topics on router security and forensics. So on the layer two uh, side, we will talk about uh, most of the layer two protocols you are used to, to see uh, out there in the world. It doesn't work. This, uh, this screen doesn't work. No, it doesn't work then. Sorry. So we'll, uh, I will present ARP, STP, CDP, uh, DPT, and also VLAN and uh, HSRP, VRP. So the goal will be to show you what can be done with uh, those different protocols and how you could protect against uh, the different attacks we will present. And then Nico uh, will take over and will uh, talk general configuration information based on Cisco equipment. And uh, we'll have a, a presentation about how you can do a router forensic and uh, integrity checking for your Cisco equipment. Okay. okay, so the layer two protocol attacks are already used. Some are well known. So most of the attacks already used are IAP uh, based attack like uh, cache poisoning, uh, you have a set of tools uh, available for those attacks like uh, DSNIF and Taranis, uh, POC, and so on. So people are used to those uh, attacks, but you can do much more uh, on your uh, Ethernet-based network. Uh, mainly on uh, new protocols or protocol used for uh, high availability like HSRP and VRP. There are also a lot of bunch of attacks you can uh, manage against uh, VLANs and spanning tree protocols. Uh, what we will see in the future, uh, there are more and more people investigating this area, doing some areas, doing some research, and uh, there are more and more tools available. And uh, most of the time, the network crew is not used to uh, to have a look at this layer of the network. So the main issue is that uh, yeah, if someone managed to do or to attack you at those, at those layers, nobody will notice it. Yeah, and this small hint, uh, Nico will talk uh, more in detail uh, later on. Uh, we are seeing more and more research on uh, rootkit and uh, for embedded device of or network equipment. So I don't know if you attend the FX talk uh, earlier. He presented some nice stuff against IP printer and Cisco devices, and there are much more coming, so be prepared. Okay, I already presented uh, slide, uh, quickly the different protocol I will go through. So let's start with spanning tree. Spanning tree is uh, you probably everybody is using it, uh, even if you don't know about it. Uh, it's used to prevent loop in your Ethernet network. So mainly this protocol will, uh, will detect loop in the network and block the ports uh, to prevent the loop to happen. So on most of the switching equipment, spanning tree protocol is enabled by default on all ports. And uh, what you have to do is spanning tree protocol doesn't, uh, uh, permit, uh, it was not designed for security, so you have no way to, pro or not a lot of different way to protect against uh, spanning tree attacks. So there is a small uh, state machine presenting uh, the spanning tree uh, processing for a Cisco router. So what has to be done, as long uh, on a Cisco at least, as long as spanning tree is processed, the, block, the port will be uh, blocked. So no traffic will be received or sent over this port, which can be used later on for denial of service attack. So how does spanning tree uh, usually work? So this is a sample network with like four switches and a redundant link on the two upper switches. So spanning tree will uh, elect a root switch that will be the master for the spanning tree uh, processing. And the spanning tree protocol will run and will block the redundant links to avoid loops on the network. So basically all the traffic will go through the root switch. 
So this is nice to know. If you are now on a network with several switches and you want to do some uh, traffic interception or sniffing, uh, this could be used. You could use Spanning Tree to force the traffic to go through you. So here is our attacker connecting to the two switches. So for this kind of attack, you need to have access to two different equipment, two switches. So what you will have to do is uh, pretend to be the root switch. So this, uh, it's, an election pro it's an election process. So the only thing you have to do is to announce yourself with the higher priorities and the existing uh, switches. And then run spanning tree and force the blocking of uh, all the other ports. So doing this, uh, all the traffic uh, between the right and the left side will go through the attacker. So then you can freely sniff the, the traffic and uh, mainly nobody on the network will notice it because it's totally transparent and most of the time nobody is uh, monitoring this layer of the network. So yeah, this is quite nice and uh, uh, other kind of uh, spanning tree attack you can do is uh, one which is more well known is uh, CAMS uh, uh, MAC address uh, entry um, poisoning. So you can have a DDoS, uh, no, denial of service against the switch doing that. What you could also do is uh, force uh, infinite uh, spanning tree processing, meaning during the, as a, during the processing, all the ports are blocked. You will have a completely uh, a denial of service on your ESN network. So those attacks are pretty simple to uh, to make. The spanning tree protocol is not really easy. You have a several implementation, like in the Linux kernel, for example. You have patch for it, and you have a set of tools uh, for manipulating spanning tree. So it's really, really easy to make and uh, really easy, hard to track down because uh, once spanning tree is running, you don't have any more access to any equipment. So what you will need is a uh, serial access to all the, your switches, analyze the uh, spanning tree topology, and see and try to understand what's going on. So there are a few security measures you can use as a prevention against uh, those kind of attacks. Uh, the main one will be to monitor uh, which equipment is a root bridge. On a stable network, if you don't add or modify the configuration of your equipment, the root bridge shouldn't change. So it should be always uh, the same equipment. And if you have a large network, usually you define yourself which one is a root bridge by setting up a higher priority for this one. Another thing you can do is uh, filter MAC address uh, that can be uh, uh, available on each port. So depending on, on your equipment, you have a different command set. Uh, here we are presenting the command for Cisco switches. So you can just define which MAC address are uh, available on a, on a port to avoid someone plugging in on your network. Now to, to filter a spanning tree attack, what you should do on each port where, uh, which is not connected to another uh, switch running spanning tree, you should disable spanning tree, tree uh, frame, um, PDU. So here's the, you have, the, as example, the command line for a multi-layer switch. So it's pretty simple. And uh, you can deactivate it uh, for the whole switch or per interface. Uh, just a small note, there is a nice feature on the Cisco switches. You can filter the amount of broadcast traffic allowed on your network. So it's just a percentage of your global traffic and it's also uh, very convenient to block uh, broadcast storm and so on. So now we move to another protocol which is used by Cisco. So it's a pro proprietary protocol. So it's uh, based uh, on HDLC, this means it doesn't use uh, IP. It's a uh, multicast traffic. So basically CDP is used to uh, automatically discover your network. Every uh, equipment will broadcast a CDP uh, um, information which contains device name, network, uh, configuration, capabilities of the equipment, and so on. Okay, so this is an example of a capture uh, CDP packet. So this was in a previous conference in Kansas West in Vancouver. It was on the hotel uh, network. So this was the main router of the, the network. So mainly what you will be able to see with CDP uh, was the uh, IP address of the management network, which is the first red, red circle, so which is quite convenient if you want to uh, do attack it. And uh, you can also identify easily the model of equipment. So if you have uh, an attack for a specific model of equipment, 
uh, this is a way to identify the equipment uh, very easily. Uh, you are also to know that spanning tree is uh, subject to a denial of service attacks. So it was uh, discovered by FX last year. So you are able to just uh, yeah, send a lot of uh, CDP uh, packets to the router or uh, to the equipment and it will just crash when you, the, the CDP entries will, um, memory will be f uh, was full. So the security me uh, measure, usually you don't need CDP. Uh, you have probably other monitoring tools that don't use CDP, so if you don't use it, just deactivate it. It's uh, just simple sanity measure. So you can uh, deactivate CDP uh, for the wall equipment or on each interface on your, of, uh, uh, of your equipment. So you have the example of configuration. Yeah. Now we move a little bit uh, to the VLAN, so layer to partitioning. So as you probably all know, VLANs were not designed for doing any security. It was just for uh, network isolation, just for easier management or administration. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people tend to use VLAN to partition network. So as this protocol was not designed for security, you have a few uh, flow or at least a few points you should pay attention to. Uh, when main protocol which is used by Cisco, which is a VMPS, which is a VLAN management policy server. It's a very uh, nice protocol. You, uh, on the VMPS server, you just define a MAC address of your workstation and you define on the server which, uh, in which VLAN this address, this uh, MAC address will belong to. So you, when you want to use your workstation, you just plug on any switch and you will automatically uh, belong to the right uh, VLAN. So the program, it's uh, easy to spoof the MAC address, so if anybody knows your MAC address, they will have access to your VLAN. So yeah, just do use this protocol. That's shit. Uh, another problem with uh, VLAN will be to be able to jump across VLAN. So in the past, uh, there were several issues with the switches when uh, you were able to, uh, to break the, the switch by jumping from one VLAN to another. In the latest release on uh, most of the equipment, it's uh, yeah, impossible or much harder to do. However, uh, there are some protocols used for VLAN management, so like uh, DTP, which is Dynamic Trunking Protocol. So DTP is used to send several VLAN bit uh, across switches. So typically uh, on one port, you will have all the VLAN uh, going through this port. Uh, one main problem is that on, most, on a lot of equipment, uh, all the ports are able to do DTP by default. So you just have to plug to the equipment and say, okay, hello, I want to do some trunking. So the switch will say, okay, fine, let's do trunking. And then you will have access to all the VLAN uh, on the switch. So you will just have the choice, you will, you will be able to choose on which VLAN you want to send your packets. And well, it's done. Uh, yeah, mainly. So, main uh, protection of against DTP is uh, just deactivate it on each port which, does, uh, which doesn't uh, need to run trunking. So by default, only the, the port between switches which are in trunking mode should be uh, allowed to use DTP. Another nice protocol is VTP, which is a VLAN trunking protocol. It's a protocol used for uh, centrally manage all the VLAN. So with, with, uh, with, with, with this protocol, sorry, uh, you will be able to, instead of going to each equipment and define which VLAN are available on your network, uh, you, you will only need to go to one equipment, define the VLAN, and it will be spread across your whole own, your own network. So it uses CDP-like frames and it communicates only over trunk ports. So using this protocol, you can easily uh, add, remove VLANs, or create uh, spanning tree loops in your network. So definitely, uh, you should deactivate it, or at least uh, set a password uh, on it, so you have an example of command for Cisco switches. Okay, oh, going back to the DTP. 
So, as I said, uh, with TP you can uh, inject fra frames in uh, any VLAN you want or uh, jump between uh, VLAN. So, deactivate it if you don't need it. Okay, another protocol which is often running if you have uh, high availability or uh, yeah, equipment, it's uh, HSRP and VRP. So, HSRP is used mainly by Cisco and VRP is a more standard uh, protocol used by um, like Nokia, Checkpoint Firewall One, and so on. Uh, the goal of those protocols is to provide the next up redundancy. This means uh, an IP address will be shared between two equipment. One will be master, one's uh, standby. And if the master fails, the standby equipment will take over the IP address. So this protocol is uh, usually using uh, multicast for advertising between both equipment with a virtual MAC address. Uh, what you have to know is uh, with uh, Cisco routers, if you have more than two routers in a uh, standby group, you don't need to, ca to kill any uh, router to take over the IP address. You just need to advertise yourself which is, uh, with a higher priority. Uh, and then you will have the IP address and we will get all the traffic. So this protocol supports MD5 authentication, so yeah, activate it. So the, here you have the command uh, for, the, for the authentication part, and you can also define yourself the MAC address you want to use for, for this protocol. Uh, if you really want to add another layer of security, you could use IPsec for the communication between the two equipment. Uh, main problem is that uh, HSAP is using multicast frames, so it's quite tricky to set up of, on your equipment, but it's possible depending on your iOS release. And definitely, it's only limited to two routers because you, not have, you cannot have multi points IPsec tunnels. So VRP has uh, mainly the same issue as IPsec. Now I will go to another issue is uh, uh, once something is going wrong on your uh, network, what can you do to troubleshoot it? Uh, yeah, one way of doing it is to do it locally on the equipment. So depending on the kind of equipment and the, the model and the volume of traffic you have on it, it may be more or less uh, easy. Uh, most of the time, if you have uh, heavy loaded uh, equipment or switch, as soon as you will uh, enable some debugging or uh, traffic uh, dump on the equipment, you will just crash it. However, it's possible. So uh, on Cisco uh, switches, you just have to define an ACL for the traffic you want to, uh, to dump. And uh, definitely, uh, please activate uh, login buffer so the output is not directly printed on the console but in the buffer that you can access easily. Uh, so the, this kind of uh, monitoring or traffic dumping will have a high CPU impact on your router. And as I said, most of the time it will crush your equipment. Uh, another way of doing it is, uh, if, you are, if you are working on the router, is to send the traffic you want over uh, a GRE tunnel to another or tunnel to another device. So one way, easy way to do that is uh, using a GRE tunnel, which is IP over IP encapsulation, and uh, you can use a tool like TunnelX on the other side to receive the traffic and analyze it. Uh, when you're on switches, uh, it's a little bit more convenient than on a router because you have uh, what is called spanning tree port. So uh, those ports allow to, uh, with those ports you can mirror the traffic of your switch uh, to this port. So you, just, you can plug your PC or any other equipment to, to, uh, to analyze the traffic. Uh, so depending on what, can, what model of switch uh, you are working on, you can monitor the whole switch traffic or define the VLANs you want to monitor, etc. A uh, nice feature you have also on uh, 6000 series of, uh, from Cisco is that you can send a, a span port all across several switches. Let's say you have four or five, uh, 6509 on your network, you just link them, and uh, the, uh, spanning tree, uh, the spanning port of, uh, of mirroring port of one switch will be sent across all the switches to the last one, and you just need uh, to plug in one place to monitor your traffic. So this feature is called AirSpan. And uh, the, nice, the nice thing is that on switches, you have a performance impact which is close to zero with uh, port mirroring. 
Okay, this was uh, for the layer, th layer two part. So Nico will continue on with the router configuration and the uh, router forensic. Thank you. So we're going to go ahead with some configuration basics, forensics, and so on. Don't write. Don't try to write everything down. We're going to put the presentation online and give you the address at the end on the last last slide, so you can get a copy of it. So basically, like any operating system, uh, routers, switches, and so on, uh, also have a lot of services turned on by default that nobody needs. So the, fir the first four tables you see are all the basic services you should turn off because they are really not useful in most of the environments you guys run routers or switches in. What is also important is to use syslog to log all the traffic to a remote workstation running syslog d, syslog ng, or some other kind of, of syslog servers. Don't forget that everything that is running on a router and logged locally on the router is lost when you boot it. Is it only stored in, uh, in RAM, not in flash or NVRAM. And as usual, run some NTP client on every device to get some time synchronization, and uh, this will also help a lot to, to debug and have a look at the forensic side. So the one the slide before was basically all the global configuration commands you have to use. Uh, that ones are the ones they have to use on the uh, interface level. So basically, you have to deactivate all the things like source routing, directed broadcasts, and so on and so on. Uh, if you guys are running multicast in your network, just make sure that the, some routers cannot just jump in and uh, become a rendezvous point to uh, so too sensible. Become a rendezvous point uh, at the multicast level so that people can try to inject new frames. And one thing that is really nice on, on most of the devices is to use loopbacks. Uh, usually, your routers have a lot of interfaces, each interface is an IP address, and depending on the interface that is used to send information out, like a uh, log message, for example, or SNMP trap, the IP address you're going to have in the log is going to be different. So if you use a loopback and tell the box to use a loopback to do that, you will always find the same uh, IP address or name in your logs. That also helps a lot when you have to debug. So SNMP, well, everybody dislikes SNMP but has to use it because it's the, the protocol that is running and that most of the people use. So uh, V1 is the old one that uses, that everybody knows, uses SNMP communities, so to say, as a password to get access to the information. Uh, V2 had uh, security or something that is called, used to be called party by Cisco and uh, get bulk to get more information than just going over a set and then get next, get next and so on. Uh, most of the new iOS releases support SNMP v3. So that one has integrated key checking, encryption, and can even have a user defined locally on each, uh, on each router. So you don't have to use the one same community everywhere on your network. So most of the known attacks, I mean, you guys know about it. So I'm just going to go over it quickly. The weak communities, I, we still see a lot of guys using public, private, the name of the device, the name of the guy, and this kind of thing. So. Just, yeah. Free. Information leak. Also, don't forget that when you guys set up uh, an SNMP management tool, network management tool, network monitoring tool, that you have to restrict uh, the IP space you want this SNMP community to send out. Otherwise, you're going to send the information out to the whole internet. We have seen that happen sometimes, so don't give your community out. So what you can do, you have two options as usual uh, when you have some things running on the Cisco devices. It's use IP level filtering. That means you're going to filter out the packets as they arrive at the interface. Or you can do application level filtering that is define an access control list and use it kind of for access control at the, at the application level. What you can also do, which is a kind of nice option on that, on that one, is to restrict the view you're going to give the SNMP community. That means if you have some tools that just go ahead and dump the whole SNMP MEEPs from your router, you can just include, exclude some of them so that you don't send every time, like doing 10 minutes SNMP information back. So V3 is starting to be supported by most of the devices. Uh, we have an example of how to define a user, a group, and uh, just permit access. Uh, that one, for example, is using MD5 uh, uh, for, to do the authentication and uh, TES56 to do the encryption. This is just a basic example. Uh, you guys have probably heard that SNMP had a lot of weaknesses recently. Uh, Cisco was affected by a lot of bugs in the last two years. 
One of them was the hidden ELMI community. That one is used uh, usually in ATM networks, but was activated by default even if you don't have any ATM interfaces on your equipment. So all this uh, this SNMP bugs, especially the one that affected most of the vendors because it's in the core SNMP that means ASN1 uh, is always a problem. You have to run SNMP, but you have to find the right middle is running it open, not open, and uh, so tune it and just don't activate it by default. You also have, uh, since uh, recent releases of iOS, SSH support. Basically, it's the same SSH as the one from SSH.com from the 1.2.26.27 series. So this implementation by Cisco has the same bugs as the old SSH1 release. So CRC32 bug, the key recovery, traffic analysis, and so on. Uh, bad thing, uh, you can use, uh, of course, triple death, and uh, you cannot use keys to indicate on, on, the, on the router or on the switch. Uh, and the other downside is that you have to run an image that uh, supports uh, SSH, and usually they are more expensive. But you can run SSH on any Cisco router or any Cisco switch. So configuration is quite basic. You just have to define hostname, generate a RSA key for the box and activate it. Also, since most of the 12.2 releases, you can use SCP to SCP in and out the router instead of TFTP or Telnet, which is clear text. IPsec configuration, not much to say about it. Uh, if you, want, you guys want to use IPsec instead of SSH to manage the router, you can just define uh, the IPsec configuration. You you can try to deny all traffic except IPsec, but it's not working t that well and quite complex. So basically, the five steps is to uh, define what you're going to accept, define the security uh, association, uh, define IC policy, go ahead, uh, define the transform sets. Um, it's up to you to use tunnel or transport mode, but if you guys are running some way to K boxes and want to use the IPsec, uh, version that is, that's coming with Win2K to manage your router, you better go with uh, transport mode. So you put that all together in, the, in a nice script map and uh, you affect it on the interface you want to use as the management interface and here you go. So SSH is much more easy to set up than uh, IPsec, but it's working too if you prefer IPsec. So going back to the router itself, uh, you can define two types of things. You can have local users on the router or you can have uh, remote users like with a central authentication mechanism that you're going to talk about. Basically, if you define some local users on the routers, uh, it's using Cisco encryption type 7, which is reversible. It's just not encrypted, it's just encoded. Uh, the enable password you're going to use to go from the normal user mode to the super user root mode is uh, using MD5, so it's not so easy to to reverse or to find out. So basically what you have to define is the local users give a password to the box and also define what kind of access you're going to give if you want to use IPsec or going to stay with Telnet or SSH. So by the, this is an example in the table below where you define the virtual terminals and uh, you say we're going to accept uh, SSH as incoming and uh, nobody can use the device itself to connect to another device that is the transport output none. That means in that example that the router cannot be used as a stepping stone to another device. So if you don't want to go for local users on the device, you can go for some AAA mechanism. Uh, the two that are supported by Cisco are Radius and TACAX. Basically what is recommended is TACAX because Radius is not that well supported and there's some limitation that you're going to quickly discuss. So you have an example of how to define uh, the router to use the TACAX servers that, uh, and with the TACAX key and always use, as you can see, the loopback zero to, uh, to send information out. What you can do, which is nice with when you use TACAX, is go for common accounting. That means that when some of your users, network administrators and so on, connect to the device, it's going to log locally all the accounting information. That means if he types show IP, BGP, neighbor, blah, 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 and so on, he's going to log that in a central log. So you can go after that and see what has been done before, crash, meltdown, all these kind of things. All these users can be given authorization and privilege levels. By default, you have in fact, you have 16 levels. The default level when you connect as a user is level one. This is kind of view-only uh, privilege. And when you change, when you type enable and go to enable mode, which is called the privilege, privilege 
exact enable, you get to level 15 where you can just do anything. It's like being root, so to say, on the device. Uh, the bad thing is that you can not do that on switches. On switches, you just have the two levels, which, is, which are 1 and 15. On routers, you can go ahead and say, OK, I want to uh, use another level bet in between 1 and 15, for example, uh, level 3, and just give some commands to that user that he can use. It's like being like a kind of SU, SU do kind of thing on the, on the Cisco device. So from that example, we, in the table, you can also see that some basic commands that are usually available in level one, like connect, telnet, SSH, that make it possible for the guy, if you don't remove transport output, to use the router as a stepping stone, will uh, remove these commands when he connects basically to the device. So as I said before, command authorization, that means asking the central AAA server for each command type if the user has the right is only working with TACAX. That means you can use a, ra a basic radio server and do, okay, if that user has this right, he can use that command. This is not working. So what you can also use, and some guys, like we used to do it too, in the past was to go for uh, Kerberos. Uh, since, you know, Kerberos has been around like 20 years already, and uh, since Microsoft is using it in Win2K in the core system for a lot of things, uh, some guys just went there, tried it, and see what's, what they can do. Most of the Cisco routers support Kerberos telnets and uh, password authentication using Kerberos exchanges. What is cool is that uh, in Kerberos, you have this kind of name for an instance. You can basically map an instance to a group, like a group of users. And this group of users can be given a kind of privilege level. So you can say you have the network admins, the network operators, the super admins, these kind of things, and can use the, the Kerberos instance to do that. Uh, bad, bad side of the things is that Kerberos is not supported on the low-end and high-end devices, only middle range. Uh, on the Cisco switches, it only works with, uh, with telnets, not with SSH up to now. So two, two basic examples of how, how to configure uh, Kerberos to do this instance mapping and uh, use a Kerberos server with a Kerberos well. So ACLs. Uh, ACLs are basically access content lists that can be used to filter traffic that's going into the router, coming out of the router, going over the router, that means traffic that is being forwarded. The bad side of ACLs is that on the Cisco device, if you don't use the firewall feature set, it's not stateful and it doesn't do any reassembly. So, you know, if you guys are using Nmap and you can port scan by using, you know, the right FTP data port and the scan the whole internet network when the guys are using, uh, allowing incoming FTP or outgoing FTP. Log input is a keyword that you can use that will also load the source interface and the source MAC address uh, when a packet is dropped. And don't forget that since it doesn't do any reassembly, that most of the time only the first fragment is filtered. So next to that, I have the, the different type of SEL types. Uh, the standard one that nobody uses is basically a source IP address only kind of SEL. The extended supports IP address, source destination, protocol type, ports, and also uh, the established keyword. But since it doesn't do anything stateful, if you use the keyword established, it's only going to check if the ACK or RST bit is set. This is the only thing that's checked. It doesn't have any table database is going to look up to see if the, the thing is allowed. So the other kind of ACLs are uh, the turbo ACLs that use a hash table. This is not bad because usually what happens is that for every entry in the ACL list, the route of each packet is going to process it. And as if you have a lot of traffic on your network or l huge ACLs, the route is going to die quite quickly. In the 72 series and up, uh, you can use Turbo ACLs. Basically, it will take all the ACs, put them together in a hash table, and you will have a constant lookup uh, rate of five, uh, so to say, cycles per packet, and even if you use 1,000 entries. The other one I'm not that used. Uh, I'm not going to go over it. It's just more or less for, for information. So this is basically an example of how to use ACL in a router. You define the, the access list, uh, and by default you say, well, I deny everything and only accept some kind of the things. We have seen that some iOS releases, if you don't put the port range, that means the 1676735, it's going to load the packet, but not the source port, uh, source port and not the destination port. This is quite strange, but we don't know why at the moment. So ACL on the switch can be used too. But uh, 
not recommended and uh, you're going to hit a lot of problems if you start to play with LCLs on a multi-layer switch or if your MSFC is going to be hit by all the packets to drop and these kind of things, but it can be done. So, rotor integrity checking, we are heading towards the end. So, basically, some two years back, we were trying to find a way to, to do some integrity checking of our configuration. Um, recently, like one year ago, uh, Tripwire, the guys that are doing the, the Tripwire's file integrity checking system, came up with um, Tripwire like for iOS. And basically, you can do that for free with some tool, free tools. So, what we are doing is we are storing the configuration in a central CVS or any kind of central uh, system to store files and uh, keeping up with the regions. So, what you have to do is to use something like CVS and then find a way to get the configuration from the device. You can, be, you can use a crypto telnet, you can use a SSH. What you can do also, but we do not recommend it, is use SNMP. The only thing is, when you, if you want to use SNMP to tell the box to upload the configuration to the central system, you will have to use a retry community, which is basically bad. Um, once you have done that, you need to check the configuration. You can do that automatically, like every night, using a Chrome ad job or by watching the log files. Every time somebody changes the configuration of the router, you will see in, the, in your log files, this device has been configured by name of the guy, or when you see a router boot, or this kind of things. So there are a lot of events that you can use to do the checking. And then when that is done, well, just if the configuration you received with the one you, that is stored in your CVS, for example. There are a lot of limitations, as usual, with any tripwire kind of system. You have to trust the running system on the box, like iOS or CatOS. Um, we are just saying that there's no Cisco rootkit yet, but that's going to happen. We're going to talk a little bit about it later on. And you have to trust the network and this kind of things. And never forget that you have two files running on the system. One is the task startup configuration file, and one is the running configuration file. Usually, they should be the same. So, uh, router integrity checking, like two years ago when we first started to discuss if it's possible to, to do kind of route kit, route kit for iOS, we were just saying, uh, is it possible? And we started to list uh, the different points that would say, yes, it is, no, it's not. And uh, if you guys have attended Black Hat yesterday, well, FX came up with some nice answer, and no, we're going to tend to say, yes, it's really possible to do it. Basically, iOS is a closed source OS running on MIPS for the newest models or Motorola 16.8K. It's closed source, it's just a fork from a kind of PSD Unix. It has been affected by most of the bugs that affected uh, other Unix systems like the Z Zlib bug, SNMP bugs, and so on. Um, what you can do is you can try to debug the device using remote GDB access or locally with, by running GDB on the device itself. Um, while working on that, I was just looking at the book by Cisco, which is called Inside Cisco iOS Software Architecture. And what they are saying, they are saying that at the kernel level, everything is running at the same privilege. That means your BGP process, your shell, everything is running at the same level. So if you can find any hole in any process running on the device, you can own the whole, the whole device. And uh, there are not a lot of things to, to check if everything is doing fine. Basically, they just emphasize on making sure that the router is going to forward packets as, much, as fast as possible, not that the device is going to survive any failure of a process. And usually what happens when the process dies in the box, the router does, does a forced software reboot anyway. So, open questions. Uh, about that. This, this may have been changed. I have not updated it since yesterday, so tell me if you see some wrong things. So what do we have? You don't have any local, so say, tools to play and uh, with the device itself. It's not like a Unix or a Microsoft system. You just go, if you are missing the tool, you just upload the tool to the device and you start to play with. This is not so easy since it's running a multi kernel that you cannot change easily. Uh, on the switches, you have uh, an enable engineer mode that you can go to. You have some public documents on that on the internet where you can really play with the switch itself but since you're lacking most of the of the configuration files documents describing how it's working uh, it's not easy to understand what's going on uh, what we've been thinking of if is that if there are any way to upload a modified iOS image to the box uh, first of all to change it and uh, then secondly is it is it really possible to go there and say okay can we do that state free? That means upload a new iOS, run it, and kill the old one without having the router reboot. Um, 
it may be possible if you use uh, dual root processors like on the broadband concentrators or if you just go there and try to upload, uh, upgrade line cards on the large GSRs, for example. Um, there are a lot of images out there you would have to patch. Basically, Cisco has 2,500 ima images out there in the field and 37 feature sets. But if you would focus on uh, an ISP, you just go there and try to uh, modify one of the service provider really strain. Uh, one, one and a half years back, Cisco was working on iOS next generation that would have uh, had uh, support for load loadable modules that will make uh, this kind, not to say our life, but will make the life of the attacker much more easy, but we haven't seen anything lately on that, so we don't even know if uh, Cisco is still working on it. Okay, so last slide, talking a little bit about forensics. Basically, like I said, a router is, like, is a hardware box running an operating system. So when you have to do some forensics, I'm not going to talk about chain of custody, uh, evidence document, these kind of things. Just give you some hints about where you could, should have a look at. So basically, at the top left side, it's all the things you're going to export. You should always make sure that you explore, export the things to your syslog server. So you will have all the packets that are dropped by ACLs, uh, dropped by unicast RPF filtering, the system informations when the interface is going to flap, if your BGP session is going to flap, configuration change and so on. You will also, if you use SNMP, but that's going to depend if you really need to upload, so to say, upload or activate traps, you will get SNMP traps. If you guys don't use local users on the system, but go for a AAA solution, you will have all the AAA logs showing when guys logged in, what they did, and so on. And also what's going to happen if you activate it on the router, when the router crashes, you can have it upload automatically through FTP, I think, uh, call them uh, of the image and uh, in the memory to see what, what was going wrong. What you're also going to have is all the NetFlow accounting data. NetFlow is basically a protocol that's going to count all the traffic that's going that's flowing out the router and log it centrally uh, to help you analyze your traffic flow. It's usually used to do traffic engineering. And what we would recommend too is to make sure that you get somewhere on some other routers copies of the routing protocol information. Routing protocol information change quite quickly. And what you could do is run a dedicated device that's just going to be a BGP, an OSPF neighbor, for example. And from there, running, for example, Z Zebra on a Linux box or KD, stored all the information at least for some minutes to see what happened just before uh, the network was down or somebody got into a router. What you need uh, on the left hand side till is, well, if somebody is going to boot the, the router or DHCP or boot B, you could, he could just go there and make the device reboot and get the configuration and the iOS image from a remote location. That means that even, he could, even if you have the iOS locally on the flash card, he could just boot the device and have it download the configuration from a remote site. So just uh, make sure that this is not feasible and watch it somewhere. So clock synchronization is always quite important as usual. Uh, on the left hand side, you shouldn't forget that you have basically two things running on most of the devices. That is RAM, which is volatile, and flash, that is basically non-volatile. So what you have on the flash card usually is the iOS release, that can be the one that runs in memory on a new one, and also the, the, config the two configuration files. What is stored in DRAM RAM or DRAM, depending on the hardware, is the running iOS, all the processes, the routing information, all the debugging logs, the history logs, and so on. So don't forget that basically what, what you see is that when somebody does front six, it just unplugs the cable, boots the device, and see what's going on afterwards. If you do that with a router, you lose, every, you lose more or less everything. So don't forget that. So what is important, as I said, is First of all, with a router, if you cannot get into anymore because the guy changed the password, is check your remote logs and accounting data to see if some strange activities were going on just before. There's also a, sorry, a nice tool that allows you to read the flashcards format, formatted in Cisco formats, which is available at that address. Uh, you can use it in, uh, as a PCMC uh, uh, laptop. So always make sure that you sync before you reboot if you have done everything that check all the local buffers, the local logs, the local information. I have some comments on the bottom to what you should have a look at. And don't forget that if you try to connect our Telnet SSH to the box, you're going to make sure that the guy is going to see it. So the best thing, if you can have a local physical access to device, is go over the console port. That's the basic thing. 
also what you can do, especially if the guy managed to broke the route and so that you cannot get into it anymore by changing username, password and so on is if you have switches uh, running around the route and if you don't have a, like one based point to point connection it's go there and put the switch in, uh, in mirror mode and span and, uh, mir and span mode and mirror all the traffic that's going into and leaving the router to see if you can find some evidence on who is connected to it and who is playing with it. So basically I have some local commands that you can type if you can get to the box. You have to have a look at the app cache, CDP neighbor information, Cisco Express, Express routing information, the NetFlow accounting data, the logs, the debug, the active TCP sessions, interface status, and you can also have most of that by doing a show tech support, but don't forget that if you do that, you won't have all the communities and passwords in the configuration you're gonna save. So, that basically was it. We, we're gonna put the, the presentation online in the next few days at that address. You, you will be able to grab the one from Black Hat that has all the information about NetFlow, DDoS detection, OSPF, BGP attacks and at the same address. So just write that one down and uh, you should get the things from there. If you see, if you see that it's not online, uh, in the next few days just drop us an email and uh, we're really gonna make sure that we put it online. Okay. Um, I have to say, yeah, okay, give me a second. Question d'abord. Okay. So, you guys, do you guys have questions about that? Yeah. Come on. Yeah, if you have questions, just come over to us because too noisy with the thing behind us. I recently was trying to use um, secure copy functionality. I, I looked in the Cisco manuals and it tells you how to get images and configs from the router to the server. But how do you do the opposite with secure copy? Say I want to upgrade the router and I don't want to use TFTP. Is there an equivalent way to make SCP upgrade a router? Okay, SCP, uh, basically what we know and what you have seen is that you have both uh, client and server support on the device itself. So we have tried it and for us it's working, so maybe you just hit the bug in some iOS release. Yeah, because I'm unfortunately it's a fairly new device. It's a, it's a, it's an access router, and they basically don't support the they support the client side, but not the server side. And I wondered if you know of any workarounds, or am I stuck? No, not that we know of. Sorry. Okay, I'm stuck. Thanks. How much of this information applies to Cisco PICS firewalls at the same time? You can speak just a little loud in. How, how much of this this information you've given us applies to the Cisco PICS firewalls? For instance, the you said that the established only checks the ACK bit? Okay, the, the question is uh, all this stateful information about this information about stateful not being stateful. So a Cisco router by itself, if you use a normal feature set that is not the, uh, the firewall feature set, won't do any stateful filtering. But the PIX firewalls, which are really firewalls, are doing real stateful filtering. So if you use the established keyword there, it's going to work. Thank you. In fact, what you have to know is that the Cisco is using different source tree for all the equipment, like the operating system for the switches, the routers, and the firewall are totally different. So they may have the same feature, but the way they are doing it, is, it may be different. Yeah, and don't forget that if you see the same command written the same way, it doesn't mean that it's going to be behaved in the same way if it's a router, a switch, a PIX firewall, a content switch, a local director, this kind of thing. So you, you better always check the release notes and the comments because this is something you, you just meant to hit something that's wrong. Some other questions? Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. Okay.